Good morning, and what a beautiful morning it is. Uh, we are so pleased to welcome you to our service, and uh, we hope that you all are doing well and safe in your homes. Um, I'd like to invite you to, uh, as the psalmist writes, as David writes in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I want to invite you to, to give him your all this morning. Lift up your voices, whatever you have in your voice, lift it up to him, your thoughts, your meditations. Lay aside your worries, your cares. Give them to the Lord. Rid yourself of distractions and just bask in his presence as we come together, even remotely from our homes. But we are one in spirit and we are here to worship our Lord. So let's worship together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, and whatever may pass, and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes, so bless the Oh, 
worship your holy name. Yes, Lord, I worship your holy name. Amen. Bless his name. Let's join together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, how grateful we are for your faithfulness to us as your redeemed, worshiping people. We have been separated so very long. We miss each other's hugs and embraces. We miss looking into each other's faces and talking and sharing and just enjoying each other. And for that reason, some of these uh, Sundays have been difficult for us. But you remain the God who is faithful, unchanging in your trustworthiness and totally reliable. And you have kept every promise you have ever made to us, even while we're separated. And so we thank you for your uh, total commitment to us your resolve uh, to do all that you have promised on our behalf, and especially for the things that you are teaching us as we uh, are together in spirit but are absent physically. And we would pray in these days, Lord, that you would receive our corporate worship even now. You are the God of all truth, and we pray that we would walk in truth. You are the God who is holy, and we pray that we would revere you and obey you. You are the God who is sovereign, and we pray that we would humbly bow before your rightful rule. You are the God of wrath, and we ask that you would help us praise you, that the judge of the earth renders righteous verdicts, and that it would be your immutable justice that moves us to speak of your mercy, grace, and love. We worship you for your great mercy, as it is called in the scriptures, and elsewhere your rich mercy, so that when a person cries for your mercy, it is always extended and never withheld. And on and on we could go, rehearsing your attributes and praising your worthiness for what each one shows us. And that you are also not only faithful and holy and sovereign and wrath and merciful. You are all-knowing and ever-present and almighty, infinitely worthy of our worship. And we especially thank and praise you that you loved the world so much that you sent your Son, your divine, holy, eternal Son, to be our our uh, substitute sacrifice, the one who takes our sin upon himself on the cross and endures that justice, that we might be extended mercy. And so as we are separated, we are still people together so deeply grateful for the gospel that is your gospel. And this morning, Lord, we ask you uh, collectively to forgive us of our sins. Each, of one, each one of us can whisper in our own hearts the sins that we need daily pardon. And we ask that you forgive our covetousness, our, our, our vainglory seeking, our hypocrisy, and all other sorts of things that bring dishonor to the sweet saving gospel that you have provided for us. And we petition you, Father, that you would give us... Um, a deeper love for you, uh, a, a more profound commitment to take up our cross daily and follow you. Uh, we've been thinking over these last numerous Sundays about asking the Father for the Holy Spirit. And today, Father, we ask that you, your Holy Spirit would fill us with himself. And that he would ripen his sweet fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That your Holy Spirit would give us boldness and rescue us and free us 
to live and speak the gospel before people uh, in our neighborhoods and among our friends and families who need to hear about Jesus and need to hear about him from us personally. And so, Father, we ask in every area of our lives there would be no area that isn't yielded to the sweet and sovereign spirit of the living God. Lord, make us more and more worshiping people. Uh, give us a song, not just in the next few minutes, but a song through our whole day and through our whole week. That our uh, response quite often and quite frequently is not only to pray without ceasing, but to worship frequently and fervently as well. And later this morning, as we think about the preached word of God, we ask, I would certainly ask for the fullness of the Spirit and would ask that you make us Spirit-filled listeners and conform us more and more so that our lives are more and more brought into line with what the Holy Scriptures teach us. We pray in your name. Amen. Here to worship an almighty God who is infinitely greater than the darkest evil that we can come across. So let's worship him. Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations. Let's sing it out. Savior, He can move the mind. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the
great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living Lord. who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of Step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. And you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Yeah. 
the Savior save thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. I encourage you to open your Bible to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. This is the fourth sermon, I think, in our series on Pentecost. And today we come to a sermon preached by Peter the Apostle, who was filled with the Holy Spirit. And when he preached from the Old Testament Scriptures, the Gospel, 3,000 souls were converted who listened to a single sermon. It's a magnificent sermon, and I would like for us today to survey some of the details and qualities of that sermon. And to begin, I would like to read verse 14 of Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, that's the large crowd gathered in Jerusalem, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to these 
words. Give ear to my words. And later in verse 22, while the sermon is really ramping up, he says, listen to these words. Even in his preaching, he is urging the congregation to realize the necessity of preaching and listening to sermons. The Apostle Peter preaches a sermon that is biblically saturated, a sermon that is Christ-centered, and a sermon that is preached by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the first thing I want you to see is that it is a biblically saturated sermon. We see that in verses 14 through 21 where the apostle announces the passage from which he will proclaim the truth of God. Let's read those verses. Verse 14, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days... I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter starts by announcing and by quoting his text. It is from Joel 2. It is a prophetic sermon where he stands and preaches from that Old Testament prophetic book And in doing so, he shows us that preaching ought to be filled with Scripture. If you read through the sermon, there are numerous allusions to Old Testament Scripture. Later, he will preach in this same sermon from Psalm 110... And then later still, when he talks about the resurrection of Jesus, he will refer to Psalm 16 as proof of the resurrection. What this means is that Peter betrays the fact that he is totally devoted to the scriptures of the Old Testament being the Word of God. He truly believes in the core of his being that the scriptures of the Old Testament are inspired and infallible and authoritative from God himself and that these very scriptures are saturated with the gospel. Think about it. This man, discipled, mentored by Jesus, who is now a man whose very life is immersed in the Word of God. He uses a sermon and a text from the Old Testament Scriptures to validate the experience and the happenings on the day of Pentecost. He is preaching a sermon 
that is a biblical sermon. There are direct quotes to the text, explanation of the text, and there are allusions and full quotes in the balance of his sermon to various texts of Holy Scripture. What this means, what we must see, what we must get is that it is not enough to preach a sermon that is merely based on Scripture. We're not to preach a a sermon that we read a text and only refer to lightly as we communicate our ideas. Since the day of Pentecost, the standard has always been that our sermons must ooze Scripture. They must be biblically saturated sermons. And that is what Peter actually did. You know, there is an interesting story in Acts 17 where two great preachers, the Apostle Paul and Silas, enter a city, the city of Berea, And they locate the believers in that city whom we are told are noble people. And these great preachers stand in front of these Christians and it says that they preach the word of God to them and the gospel is received with eagerness. The word of God is embraced with enthusiasm. But this thing is added to it that the Bereans searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things are so. They measured the apostles' teaching and they verified the trustworthiness of it by seeing for themselves that what was preached is validated by Holy Scripture. Because they expected a sermon to be in full alignment and agreement with the Word of God. And so what the Apostle Peter does here on the first day of the Christian church is preach a sermon that ever since that time is required of all preachers. And the reason we know this is because in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, all preachers of that day up to our day are required not simply to preach, but to preach the Word. That is to say the Word of God is to be the source of our preaching, the anchor of our preaching, the focus of our preaching, it must be full of Scripture. Listen to these words. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the Word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove rebuke and exhort with complete patience. Do you see what the apostle is commanding and and in terms of expectations of preachers? He says, imagine yourself standing in the presence of Christ. You are being charged. Another version reads, you are being solemnly charged to deliver sermons that are sermons that are rooted in and grow out of the Word of God. And you're to do it when sermons are popular. And you're to do it when preaching is unpopular. You're to rebuke in sermons. You are to restore in sermons. You are to exhort and encourage in sermons. But it is always to be the Word. So that when the people listen and examine their own Scriptures... Your helpfulness is only to the extent 
that it is giving the sense of the meaning of Holy Scripture. And Paul continues in verse 3 of 2 Timothy 4. For the time will, is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will for themselves find teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Be faithful to the task. Never give in to the pull of a secular culture or a worldly church to preach to satisfy itching ears. Preach against the myths and for the truth. Even if it requires your suffering, endure, faithfully fulfill your ministry. Preaching is only valid if it is filled with Scripture. That's the first overall great characteristic of that preaching. And I can't wait for us to examine more thoroughly Joel's prophecy in our next sermon. But the second great reality about preaching, the necessary quality or characteristic, is that all biblical preaching must be Christ-centered preaching. If you put your finger on verse 22 and another finger on verse 36 you are looking at the largest section of the sermon. And every bit of that section, all of it, is entirely focused on Christ. So that Peter's biblically saturated sermon is simultaneously a Christ-centered sermon. And it's really rather astonishing how much of the person and work of Christ Peter is able to cram in to this central theme in his sermon. For example, in this sermon he talks about the miracles of Jesus. Verse 22 Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourself know. You know Jesus did wonders and miracles. Some of you experienced those miracles. Some of you saw them performed with your own eyes. You know that the miracles of Jesus not only underscore His compassion and power in the lives of those who hurt, but they primarily exist to verify that He's the promised Messiah. You know about His miracles. His great power and compassion. His Messiahship. And then He mentions the crucifixion of Jesus, verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. That while the cross is ultimately God's sovereign plan, those who kill Jesus are morally culpable. You killed him. You put him to death. And a few verses later, he begins to explain that Jesus is on the cross to purchase our redemption, to secure our forgiveness. And then in the next verse, he preaches about the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 24, God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it, that is death. For David says concerning him, 
So he declares the resurrection of Jesus and quotes David in the Old Testament to verify that the resurrection was expected. Again, saturating his sermon with the Bible. And then in verse 32, he again speaks of the resurrection. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. The all there is a reference to the 120 that had seen Jesus alive, whom now the Holy Spirit was feeling, feeling and they were witnessing. So that the mighty resurrection of Jesus is proof that the cross work is acceptable by God. If that's not enough, the very next verse, verse 33, refers to the exaltation of Jesus. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing for as David said. And so the ascension is verified by Scripture. So he preaches about the cross of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus and His exaltation, and even says what you're witnessing here is the Holy Spirit being poured out by Christ from His place of exaltation. All of this to say that this is a profoundly Christ-centered sermon. And it should always be so. Back in the uh, 1800s, Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher in London, used to train young preachers quite regularly. And one day Spurgeon and this young preacher were thinking along these lines. And Spurgeon felt that the young preacher needed to be uh, convinced that Christ-centered preaching was utterly crucial. And so he said to this young minister, wherever you are, whatever street you're on, you know, wh whatever section of the city you find yourself, whatever little hamlet you may be visiting, there is always a road. To London. And then he said to this young preacher, when you come to a text and master that text, get on the road that leads to Christ. There is always a road to Christ. You will never find a passage anywhere in Holy Scripture where there's not a road to Christ. And he's right. And the reason Spurgeon believed that and the reason we should is because he is familiar with the sermon Christ preached to two disciples on the Emmaus Road where we are told in that narrative, read Luke 24 to your heart's content, is that while he is walking with these two disciples, he opens up the scriptures of the Old Testament to them. It says... He explained to them from Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible. And then he explained to them from the prophets, which is the second major section of Scripture, and the Psalms, the wisdom literature. That Jesus surveyed the entirety of the Old Testament on that seven-mile journey. And what Jesus said was that he showed them from Moses and the prophets and the Psalms how the Scriptures teach that He, Christ, is the Messiah. The Old Testament is a Christ-centered book, all about promises made about Christ and His Gospel, and the New Testament is promises fulfilled. It is a Christ-centered book. There's a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, where this is especially brought home to us, not by Peter, but by Paul. And he says there in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, For I decided 
to know nothing among you except Christ Jesus and Him crucified. Did you, did you, do you hear the, the apostle? This is an intelligent man. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus and Him crucified. Now, Paul is not saying that my preaching is going to become monotonous because I'm never going to say anything but Christ, 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 Christ in all my sermons. What he is saying is that every theme I preach on, every biblical passage I preach about, every attribute of God I celebrate, every warning I ask you to heed, every promise I ask you to embrace, whatever the theme of the passage is, we get on the road to Christ. And it's interesting that this word, I decided, means a fixed verdict, a settled conviction, a steadfast resolve. It's as though he is saying, I I have a one-track mind, and that is to exalt Christ and Him crucified and His wonderful, wonderful gospel. One of the preachers I especially enjoy reading was a friend of the Wesley brothers, and his name is Charles Simeon. And on one occasion, he said, preaching must exalt Christ and humble the sinner and promote holiness. In other words, when we preach biblically saturated sermons that focus on Christ, those sermons need to humble the sinner so that the sinner cries for mercy. That sermon needs to encourage and promote holiness in the lives of those who've already received mercy, the believers. And the way to accomplish those two goals is to keep exalting Christ, to keep preaching Christ. And this was actually the habit of the early church. For we read in Acts chapter 5 and verse 42, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ, that that the Christ is Jesus. The center of their witness was Jesus. So we we have two great realities about preaching. The first, filled with Scripture. The second, filled with Christ. And the third is delivered by those filled with the Spirit. It is a Spirit, it is a Spirit-proclaimed sermon. The whole book of Acts bleeds that reality. In all of these sermons so far on Pentecost, I've said to you, Luke ends his gospel with the words... Wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are empowered from on high. Then Luke begins his second volume, the book of Acts, with these words. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you'll be my witnesses all over the world, starting in Jerusalem. And then in Acts 2, the first four verses, the mighty Spirit comes. The power from on high is received. And we see it in the sound of the mighty winds in the, and in the burning flames of tongues that rest as upon the believers, the 120, as they are empowered with the Spirit. And verse 5 says that they are filled with the Spirit. And in the balance of the story, they go out and preach the gospel. And in three different places, it says we hear the gospel in our own native tongue, in our own native language. They go out preaching. And one of the charges that's leveled against them is these guys must be drunk. You know, they couldn't explain away this wonderful, powerful, supernatural miracle. And so some people in the city, it says they they scorn them. Or they're just drunk. And Peter in verses 14 and 15 says, no, 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 it's too early in the morning for that sort of thing. They're not drunk. They're filled with the Spirit. They're, pre- they're preaching the gospel of Christ. 
And it is the Holy Spirit that must empower witness. Let me say it this way. And I'll be honest, I'm trying to say this in a way that is memorable. The Spirit of God empowers the preachers of God to proclaim the gospel of God that creates the people of God and changes them. Since that statement is so deliberate, I want to say it again. The Spirit of God empowers the preacher, the teacher, the witnesses of God to proclaim, to bear witness to the gospel of God that creates the redeemed and worshiping people of God and changes them. And this is what, the way Paul confirms that truth. There in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 3 and 4. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. In other words, negatively... Not implausible words of wisdom. Positively, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. Put another way, not in clever speech, not well-polished oratorial skill, but preaching that is energized by the Holy Spirit who uses the preached word to convert and to change. How desperate is our need to be devoted to biblically saturated, Christ-centered, Spirit-proclaimed sermons. These are the kind of sermons and only that we should settle for and we should listen to. And with that in mind, I would like to close with two quick responses. First, preach courageously. Teach lessons courageously. Witness to the unsaved courageously. It was courageous for Peter to tell them that their scriptures were being fulfilled in a day of disbelief. It was courageous for him to say, you killed the Messiah. It was courageous for him to declare that Jesus has risen from the dead when they were disbelieving it. It was especially courageous at the end of the sermon for him to say that you're only saved by believing in Christ. He is the exclusive way to God. And we should be courageous. We should be unashamed of Christ. Like we talked about Sunday last, that Paul prayed that he would proclaim the gospel boldly, another version, fearlessly, as I that's what Peter's doing. He is preaching a courageous sermon. And we should as well. And beloved, it takes the Holy Spirit to give us that kind of courage and boldness mixed with compassion in our witness, in our teaching, in our proclamation. And the second point is respond correctly. This is verse 37. This is the response. All this vast crowd, 3,000 are going to be converted. Because they've heard the Bible. They've been, Christ has been exalted in their sights by the power of the Holy Spirit. And how did some of the crowd respond? In verse 37 we read, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter tells them to repent of their sins, to be baptized, and they will belong to Christ and receive the Holy Spirit that they are witnessing. The chief thing here, and I can't wait to look at the other parts of the verse, 
is that he calls them to repentance. Maybe that's how you need to respond to the crucified, risen, exalted Christ who died and rose for you, whose death purchases your, convic- uh, your, your conversion. At the end of verse 22, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you come to him and be saved? And finally, will you devote yourself as a response to being a person who listens to the preaching of the word of God? And like the Bereans, you verify it by looking to the scriptures yourself and submit to obeying it. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory alone, sanctify us by truth. Your word is the truth. Help us to be a people who are biblically saturated. Help us to be a people who are Christ-focused, a people who are Spirit-filled, that we might be bold in both our worship and witness. We pray in your name. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. And my love be with you in Christ Jesus. Amen.
my soul is your power making me whole oh i will rejoice for i want more of you if the sorrow flooding this place is the Trust in your ways as I sing your praise. 